we're now at our second and final panel of the day. Um, so far, it's been very enjoyable. The first uh, panel's presentations, as you know, were all excellent. And then we had this beautiful personal intermezzo with Rob. Um, in this panel, we will speak about literature and humor as it relates to the works of Terry Pratchett. And as we're uh, running into the time slot already, I won't cause any further delays. So our first speaker, which we will have, is Yevgenia Kanchura. She is associate professor at the Theoretical and Applied Linguistics Department of Zitomir Polytechnic State University and deputy manager of the Center for Fantasy Literature Studies at the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. She wrote a PhD dissertation on Terry Pratchett and her research is generally concerned with postmodern fantasy, folklore and mythology. Today, she will speak on the translation of Pratchett into Ukrainian. So, Evgenia, that's perfect. I think I can hand over to you then. <laughs> Please. Uh, thank you very much for this project. Thank you very much for your speaking speakers. And uh, it's really a great pleasure for me as I um, have studied um, Ratchet since 2004. And uh, for me, it's a great pleasure, great joy and a great experience. And now when I can share my um, some part of my investigation, some part of my observations with the colleagues, with people around the world. It's uh, really a great pleasure. Um, so, uh, uh -huh. uh, if you look at this picture, you can see that uh, um, that's quite an interesting statistics. First of all, uh, exactly today, or it's better to say yesterday, the 16th of September is uh, the three years anniversary uh, of uh, uh, first uh, uh, officially published Terry Pratchett book in Ukrainian, uh, which was presented in Lviv at the Publishers Forum. Uh, so in three years, uh, you can see that uh, 15 books were uh, have been published uh, in uh, one publishing house in Lviv. Uh, then uh, that uh, they are Discworld series. Uh, then Yes, covers are really very beautiful. Uh, in uh, 2018, uh, Good Omens uh, was published in Kyiv. And uh, in uh, 2019, uh, The High Maggers uh, was uh, published in the selection of uh, short fantastic stories in Kharkiv. Why I uh, want to focus your attention at the cities, because Lviv is a Western Ukrainian, Ukraine, Kyiv is the capital, yes, and Kharkiv is the Eastern Ukrainian. So all Ukraine, so all our uh, publishing houses are really very interested in uh, uh, these projects, and uh, it's maybe a great opportunity for our readers because we have different. Um, uh, com uh, a great competition of the quality uh, of translation. And maybe it is uh, one of the best things. Then, uh, overall, uh, we have 12 translators who worked with the, uh, the uh, project uh, and uh, they are still working. Uh, now, uh, one novel is in publishing, three are being prepared and more and more are planned. Uh, as for reception, uh, you can see the presentations from the very first uh, uh, couple of books. And uh, uh, you can see that the rooms are overcrowded <laughs> and uh, the teams are really very interesting. If you spoke about covers uh, in the uh, bottom left, left to right <laughs> picture, uh, uh, these uh, young couple are the painters the artists who created all the covers. Uh, it's uh, really style of uh, the publishing house and it's one of the very great plus of this uh, editorial project. Uh, then as for reception, uh, what is important um, for Ukrainian translation? I must say that uh, this very short period, three years and 15 novels is interesting because uh, project for us, uh, translation project is a factor of uh, uh, our country cultural independence and uh, integration into the unlimited cultural world context. Because uh, 
we uh, have uh, uh, an opportunity to read Pratchett in Russian, and uh, Russian uh, translations were started since uh, uh, the end of the uh, 1990s. And so the market was full of these books. That's obvious. But uh, as you can see, the demand of uh, Ukrainian readers allows us uh, to uh, create, uh, uh, allows Ukrainian publishers to create this project. And it is really very popular and has market success. Uh, that is why uh, also uh, I must uh, underline that uh, the publishers work in very close contact with the social media, with readers, with the uh, uh, mass media uh, connected with the fantasy and fantastics uh, and uh, also with the scholars which is important uh, for example you know, as i uh, have been uh, studying project since uh, uh, the beginning of uh, <laughs> this millennium uh, i was in the fun club for a very long time and i know how uh, uh, the previous politics wars, uh, for example, uh, the editors of uh, Russian translators, they didn't pay any attention to the critical remarks of the readers. Uh, they did their best, but they worked mostly uh, commerce-centered. And uh, uh, even in some of the interviews, the chief uh, editor uh, stressed that uh, they are not interested in their remarks. Uh, they are working for books, especially and for our mm, mm, situation it is important that uh, the translators the editors they are always communicating with the uh, uh, readers and they listen to their opinions and most of the Pratchett, Pratchett readers they <laughs> read these books in in, in original <laughs> That's why uh, their critical remarks are um, quite often very interesting and uh, useful. So, uh, my report is challenges and uh, strategies. When I wrote the proposal, I started from strategies and then to challenges, but challenges are on the first place. Because we have to look at them in uh, three perspectives. First of all, it is post-Soviet. Uh, challenges because uh, you know we grow up behind the iron curtain and uh, many of the um, elements of popular culture uh, of the western world uh, were, uh, were just um, banned for us uh, and uh, if you play jazz today tomorrow you will betray your motherland sorry for <laughs> quotation in my native language and uh, um, uh, then we just didn't know we could, cannot spot uh, the references which are so frequent in project books and then another point is post-colonial ch challenge because um, we all depend on uh, the huge uh, neighbor and uh, the policy. And uh, as I have said, for Ukraine, uh, translating project is one of the independent sector. And uh, actually, the common challenge, which is, uh, I think, uh, uh, well known for all over the world is intertext and wordplay and irony so postmodern. Uh, as for uh, post-Soviet, uh, as I have said, uh, we had different uh, cultural background. And for example, it is very difficult to translate more what is done because uh, all our translators uh, translated as a folk dance, but it's not general folk dance, right? Uh, it's very, very difficult to interpret this point. Then, uh, as for elements of popular culture, like uh, uh, books of Fritz Lieber, uh, which are classics for uh, Western world, they were not uh, known in our countries at all. Uh, at that period, so reading uh, The Color of Magic, uh, did not give this opportunity to uh, didn't give the opportunity to spot these uh, references and uh, finally um, 
it is important to stress that time gap because books which were written in uh, uh, 90, uh, 80, 1983, they are translated in 2017. And the things which were popular in that period, in the 1980s, um, they just uh, um, they're just lost from uh, the collective memory, maybe. And um, what strategies can be used in this situation? First of all, they are footnotes. And I must uh, uh, say that uh, our scholars like Mikhail Nazarenka do a really very great job uh, for uh, footnotes. And our translators also work with the uh, uh, scholars. Uh, in many books, <laughs> the translators leave their footnotes with a reference to private scholars without naming them. It's very fun, actually. And uh, such um, um, experts in uh, fantasy literature, like uh, the writer Vladimir Arinev, they just work like uh, consultants, uh, like assistants uh, for our translators. And it is, again, very important that our public helps our publishers and our translators to uh, perform their uh, best work in this uh, point. But uh, it's very sad to say that some cases of meeting are quite frequent and uh, what can we do? Uh, when uh, this project has started, nobody believed that Pratchett can be translated into Ukrainian. But we have uh, 15 novels of this world. As for post-colonial, it's just a fact. It's not good or bad, it's just a fact of our life. And uh, Russian uh, really used to be the dominant language in the whole territory of uh, former Soviet Union. And uh, uh, for now, I have found only four countries uh, which have their own translations of Pratchett books. They are Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, so Baltic culture, uh, countries, and now Ukraine. They, uh, so again and again, I stress that uh, uh, translating Pratchett is a factor of our cultural independence. Then uh, publishing and commercial priorities, uh, which I inherited from the Soviet epoch, they uh, are mostly given to the Russian language books. And um, in some cases, Ukrainian translation was called like redundant translation, which is not true, definitely. And uh, uh, another point is a commercial uh, side of this uh, uh, process, because uh, Russian books are cheaper. Uh, they are published in greater numbers. Uh, the uh, copyrights are cheaper for Russian publishing houses and uh, their translators uh, work for another price. Uh, also, very uh, good factors, as for me, uh, well-developed fandom, which uh, w w unites readers from many uh, countries of former Soviet Union and all over the world also. And they are mostly Russian speakers. So you can see the illustration on this page, which were created by um, the representatives of this fandom whom I know in person. And uh, uh, the Russian variants of names also are very uh, uh, habitual and uh, uh, well uh, known for all the readers, post-Soviet readers, and a uh, new translation sounds strange for them in some uh, moments, uh, even if they are not correct. Because in Russian, this quote is translated like Ploskimir, so it's flat world. Uh, and uh, my proposal was to translate it like disco suite, uh, that's literally a disc world. And uh, when uh, the series was announced, all the scholars uh, <laughs> shouted in one voice that it must be disco, a disco suite, not plus key suite. Well, and um, uh, as for Ukrainian strategy, you must not be a competitor, to be a successful competitor for the uh, neighbor's uh, books. Uh, you must translate from the scratch, never translate from Russian because it's um, a shame. Uh, and uh, uh, then you have to balance uh, between domestication and foreignization. It is really very important because to be different, uh, you have to find your own Ukrainian project. Uh, you have to uh, interlocate um, uh, 
his uh, view of uh, of uh, fantasy world into our Ukrainian background, and the uh, translation tools are used exactly for this. Uh, then, uh, what I have mentioned, wide communication with the readers and scholars, uh, compare the experience of other languages, and as it was mentioned previously, book design, paper, bookmarks, pictures, uh, serious markers, reading seam. Reading seam is perfect, in my opinion. You can see it is now published in every book of the series. You can even visualize what was published and how to read. And each um, Syria has its own mark. So a hat for Rinsweed, a cauldron for witches, and so on and so forth. Uh, then um, uh, what I want to stress as a literature scholar, not as a translation scholar, that um, I regard Terry Pratchett's work not as strictly humorous fantasy as many of the critics do, but as a postmodern fantasy with a main focus on the model of a textualized world. So I think that the key fantasy premise uh, of his uh, work is that the work, the world is a text. So that texts, text influences on people's minds. And recreation, this textualized world, is the key point in the Ukrainian translation. That is why I analyze it through this um, point of view, through the point of textualization. And the elements of textualization, in my opinion, are names and uh, uh, books, uh, book titles, uh, the translation of realia and language atmosphere, dialects and essence, which are also the part of language atmosphere, world play and puns, Ideas, illusions, and quotation, and again, stress balanced adapt of adapt between adaptation and localization. As for titles of the novels, no, maybe it is the most uh, cruel point, uh, because uh, sometimes we think that Terry Pratchett uh, created the titles of his novels, especially to kill some of the translators, because uh, very short, very deep. Uh, with a deep meaning and deep sense, and so difficult to translate in the same amount of word, words that uh, translate or die. And uh, for example, there were lots of arguments about equal rights, and final uh, translation was prava na chare, uh, that is uh, right for rights, or right for magic, but uh, uh, if uh, continue the pun, it will be right for rights. Right. Uh, then uh, going postal, Postova uh, Lehomanka, which uh, references to the Golden Rush, the Lada Lehomanka, Dobry Piridvisniki, Good Omens, and so on and so forth. So uh, it's maybe very good that we have uh, um, such uh, talented uh, approach to the translation of the titles. Then uh, as for proper names, you know that common uh, strategies like transliteration and substitution uh, when you just translate uh, the word, but uh, the most challengeable is maybe uh, morphemic, morphem to morphem translation or naturalization when you translate the words um, uh, through the, their parts. And uh, for example, one of the funniest examples for me is uh, Andrews, uh, uh, altogether Andrews, who is translated like uh, Andrews Razum Nas Bohato. Razum Nas Bohato, it was the slogan of uh, uh, the first Maidan, 2004. Uh, when we are together, we cannot be uh, mm, uh, crashed. <laughs> so, and uh, so altogether and Razum Nas Bohato, so which, which provides the reference to Ukrainian uh, background and at the same, it demonstrates that um, it's just a joke and a local joke, not project, but local. Uh, also, Mary character, character names are translated with the addition of various national index like uh, Zlotny, Krik, Krik, uh, it's Otto Shrik, and uh, it's a nearly literal translation. Uh, Krik is a Shrik also. Then, 
as for language atmosphere, dialects and accents, um, it was a question whether to translate, uh, whether to leave in the text Mr. or Mrs. or Lord, or translate these words into Ukrainian equivalents. And uh, the uh, publishing houses uh, de decided to translate totally. For example, Lord is translated like Pravitel, so the ruler, uh, Mr. Pan, Mrs. Pani. And uh, as for the realia, for example, Povitko uh, or Shed, uh, which are actually the same, I presented the picture. Uh, very interesting point when we have the same word in Ukrainian and in, in English, like tavern, taverna. But in, we cannot take this word. Uh, in Ukrainian, because in our language, taverna is most, mostly associated with the Mediterranean cult, uh, uh, culture, Mediterranean countries. That is why our translators have chosen the word Shinok. And uh, city language, uh, uh, there are different accents which are uh, represented in multilingual, multilingual uh, atmosphere of this world, like uh, trolls speak with a mountainous accent something from Hutu uh, uh, language. Igor speaks like Russians, because Igor is a Russian name. Uh, vampire's accent is mostly German, uh, as if it, it is common for Slavic translations. And the city language is mostly Surzhik, which is a mixture of uh, Russian and Ukrainian. Uh, then, uh, as for uh, word plays and puns and idioms, um, you can, uh, if you have an opportunity, you can replace the original uh, word play or item where it is possible, and sometimes it is really possible. Uh, then uh, translation has to omit, uh, and um, if he or she cannot represent, uh, uh, and it's really a very sad story because we lose nearly 25% maybe of the funds. And uh, uh, finally, to recreate uh, the textualized atmosphere, the translation translator can add the, uh, some uh, uh, techniques like alliteration, internal rhymes, additional senses into the translation. I can um, show you a couple of examples if I have time. Do I? Um, for example, uh, can you see the letters? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so where people put an edge on their crow bars, uh, that's stali stali tisvoyi fomki. Uh, there were no alliteration in the original text, but the uh, translator uses alliteration because it is one of the common uh, tools of uh, other project uh, texts. So it, he recreates the style, not the exact uh, uh, phrase. Or uh, was a fifth uh, half a uh, cut a load of fig twice a year. There is no rhyme in original, but it appears in uh, uh, the translated uh, uh, phrase because it again uh, um, compensates the uh, lack of uh, the omission, uh, which was in some previous points. So if we compare the percentage of uh, word play and puns, it will be nearly the same. We omit some jokes, but we represent them in another places. And uh, no, just uh, for fun, uh, for example, because uh, although it was possible to live on figs, you uh, so, soon wished you didn't. But in Ukrainian, it sounds like this. Uh, it's, uh, it comes from the word fig, but it means mostly lousy. Yeah, so very, very bad <laughs> diet. And uh, so the word gains another sense, right? Uh, which uh, exactly coincides, uh, coincides with the situation. You cannot survive only on six. Uh, or uh, the last one, uh, the dog uh, could, uh, could not talk, but it could swear. And in Ukrainian, uh, uh, 
the dog could not talk, but it could vialetisha. So laetisha, it's or laeti, havkati, it's bark. And at the same time, laetis in Ukrainian means swear. So the translator adds uh, more senses and um, emphasize, um, amplifies the author's idea. I think it's very successful examples. Uh, also, there are some special like uh, acid in the um, original and uh, uh, more uh, senses in um, English enjoy in Ukrainian nasolodzhuvatysia. Nasolodzhuvatysia, it comes from the word solodki, sweet. So it gives them the additional sense. Uh, they, uh, such findings of our translators, I think, are really very successful. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, then as for allusions and quotations, there are um, general um, uh, strategies all over the world, I think. First of all, uh, we uh, use uh, the, our translators use uh, the direct quotations from the known Ukrainian translations like Shakespeare or uh, other um, classical uh, uh, Western works. And uh, also you can replace uh, British uh, reference into Ukrainian cultural reference if it coincides. Uh, the example is uh, on the um, slide. You can see, and uh, we can see, and at, as we go, uh, it's from popular song, right? And it is period this page. It's actually from our popular song. So you take one reference from uh, popular culture and um, um, uh, replace it with the other reference in other popular culture. And finally, uh, you replace the omission. Uh, with the adding, like it was with the puns and word play, uh, word play. So, for example, the clock moved on. Uh, it was translated like a quotation from our famous uh, poet. Uh, it's changed uh, translation. <laughs> uh, then, uh, what I would like to share with you is the example, uh, the examples of cultural cultural references how they work. Uh, you can see the uh, English text on the one side. Mm. And uh, mm, I just want to stress, if in the English, uh, the keyword is medieval, um, in Ukrainian, it's not medieval, it's uh, just old traditions, Stradamnik traditi. And then uh, the author, the speaker, um, opens the meaning of uh, these medieval or old traditions. Maple, which is exactly British tradition, is replaced with the uh, Kupalskim Hilsim. It's a special tree which is raised for uh, St. Jones uh, for the Midsummer uh, Fest. Uh, Ivana Kupala. Then, It's a circle dance. Um, uh, um, then three field system. It's a literal, very uh, exact translation. Tripilska systema and uh, tripil, uh, tripilia is um, the uh, beginning of our civilization. So it's a very archetypal word for our language, for our culture. And finally, several plugs, kilkoma poshestimi. So nearly all the elements are represented, but the medieval essence is uh, uh, shifted into uh, old folk traditions. I think this uh, translation is really successful. Um, what I also like is uh, uh, how our translators play with grammar. For example, these kind of questions, which Angua um, uh, they are uh, there, not questions, response, how uh, Angwa uh, answers um, William de Ward <laughs> when he tries to interview her. So she uh, responds, but actually she says nothing. Um, does it? Can you? Did I? And so on. And in Ukraine, we don't have such a construction. That is why the translator finds 
as many synonyms as he can and uh, onyak, nevje, really, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, the um, spectrum of these uh, uh, synonyms is really very wide. So to conclude, I want to stress again and again that uh, the key point of project translation, in my opinion, as a literature scholar, is to uh, represent the atmosphere of a textualized world. Uh, and it is reached by the usage of the author's tools, internal rhyme, rhythm, alliteration, wordplay, puns, and so on, localization of the items, names, and grammar tools, balanced localization of their intertextual tools, and finally, new reading of project works. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Evgenia. That was very interesting. Um, <laughs> many thank yous coming in, of course, and we also have many questions coming in. And as time is limited, I'll uh, immediately post some if you would like. Um, one very interesting question which we had is, are the replacement folk elements for the maple and the dancing, specifically Ukrainian, reinforcing, say, Ukrainian translation as part of independent from Russia? Because uh, they are representing the Ukrainian local traditions, which are different from Russian ones. And if you compare the uh, text uh, printed, uh, edited in Russia with the same uh, edited in Ukrainian, you can find the difference in these traditions. Okay, okay. Um, and what would you say is very much the biggest challenge when trying to translate an Anglo-Saxon culture to, say, a Middle West European? So many of the challenges. <laughs> can, I, can I say all of them? The biggest challenge is, uh, first of all, that uh, not all of our readers I acquainted with the um, whole background of mythology, cultural background, cultural, cultural references, which are not so uh, massive as Arthurian cycle or Shakespeare. Uh, some small element, not very, um, not very famous elements like red caps, for example, for our cu culture, uh, red cap, it's a uh, little red riding hood, because everybody knows it from the childhood. But for um, uh, in um, the light fantastic, there is a special footnote from Arinev, who stresses the red caps are also uh, fairy folk, which are with uh, absolutely another uh, character, right? And it's difficult to demonstrate this uh, reference for our mass reader. But uh, on the other hand, I think that readers of Pratchett are not exactly mass readers. They are mostly people with a highly developed intellectual abilities. <laughs> Thank you very much. There is a question which we had in two ways, in fact. Um, one person asked about domestication or foreignization as a translation strategy. So what has been the proportion in doing that work? And another person asked, do you think it's important for the reader to identify it with cultural elements? So for example, if for some, like we've seen in previous presentations, Ankh Morpork is a kind of reimagination of London, then should that be a reimagination of a more domestic city for the UK Ukrainian public? Um, I think uh, reimagination for some Ukrainian city, it will be too much. Uh, so the balance must be the balance between domestication and uh, uh, foreignization. It is definitely must be. But for, for example, when it goes about Oberwald, yes, uh, there are so many um, references to Slavic cultures that we can focus on them more and more and uh, the translator can use more of them um, and it uh, will be good so it depends on the situation but definitely london can, 
or references to London cannot be replaced uh, by some Ukrainian cities. Okay, um, then there's one of the first questions we had, I think, um, which is more of a translation metaphorical use. Do you think that the moral values that Ratchet espoused translate well to your audience about these notions of how a society should be organized and run? Yes. Uh, that is foremost, in my opinion, because uh, moral values of Pratchett books are, are the most important, which can be translated into our culture and into our situation. Because, in my opinion, Pratchett teaches us to think independently, uh, to be free from the um, textualized uh, uh, text impact on our mind, from mind parasites. Um, to feel free in the international uh, informational society, uh, to break your filter bubble, and the, uh, to uh, think freely from uh, the stereotypes, cliché, which language uh, impacts on us. And uh, for me, this is the key point of uh, project work, which is now crucially important for Ukrainian society. Yeah, it's been mentioned in the chat, and that is effectively a very great answer. So I think we'll wrap up here now to give everyone, say, a two, three minute break before we go on to the next presenter. But I'd like to thank you again, Evgenia, for a really great presentation that was also of, of say, good commercial value because people really liked uh, the way you engaged with the work and they really liked what they saw. So that's good to hear for you as well, I think. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> And thank you for all the listeners. <laughs> thank you.